Generally, if you're more of a hothead, have some neurochemical-based problems already, like ADHD or bipolar or whatever, you're the worst candidate for it because your neurochemistry is already skewed up for that. Right. Other side of things, I've had a lot of the pros who will take a gram of trend and they get chilled, they get relaxed, they get more happy, like they don't get that response. What's up, everyone? It's Russo. I hope everyone is doing well. Episode one with Grandmaster Kiko of Based Bodybuilding. This is going to be our podcast, and this is just going to put Kiko out into the metaverse so you can interact with him. Obviously, I'm going to have all his coaching and everything. If you want to get a hold of him, definitely book something. But he's expanding into social media. Everyone who's someone who are all my original gangster followers knows of alex but alex is always always working directly with clients and hasn't had that much time to do media so this is his first splash going into this year so this podcast is going to be a data collection meaning i want to see what you guys think of our cadence talking how you're understanding alex versus how you're understanding me the way the podcast is going to go is i'm going to be the student he's going to be the teacher and I'm going to try and, you know, Kiko's the man, but I'm going to try and dumb it down so, like, I don't see the comments like, yeah, Kiko sounds smart, but, like, I just stopped listening because there was so much information I couldn't keep up with. Like, that's going to be the battle of this podcast where other people watching are already medical professionals who are going to fall in love with Kiko going to that extreme amount of detail. So, based bodybuilding is I'm trying to bring that extreme detail to someone could easily understand. So, I want to introduce Alex, let Alex give, like, how he got started in this his credentials, where he's at, and where he wants to be. So this is Alex. Everyone, you guys have already seen him, so this is nothing new. First, I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate you getting me out of my shell because, like you said, I've been in the background for over a decade now, and it was just like my personality was never to be in the spotlight. I just like doing my thing, hanging out with my family, training, learning. Like there's four things I do in life. It's family time, it's work, it's reading, it's training. It's like, those are the four things I want to do. And that's all I do with my daily life. I don't follow, like go on my Instagram. I follow one person. It's my wife. She doesn't post, but I can't unfollow her because that doesn't look too good. Um, but it's like, I don't follow the news. Nothing. Like I live in my own world and that's why I'm so happy. So I've never really pushed into getting really deep into, like you said, social media and being out there. And so you kind of got me out of my shell with that because I never wanted to. And then we had some conversations about where things are going. Um, with some of the work I've been doing in the background and kind of in the forefront as well. And it's just kind of time. So I do appreciate you for that so, so much. But uh, yeah, okay, so my background, super simple. I was uh, starting off in high school. I was doing lacrosse. I was doing some amateur boxing. Never really had any crazy good amateur boxing stuff. I just really like messing around with some different professional boxers and doing some fun stuff like that. Lacrosse, though, was my home. I loved it so much. I was on crease. So I, was, I wasn't the normal crease guy with lacrosse though, right? Normally they sit on, sit right there and they just ping goals all day. I'd yeah. run around, I'd, I'd jab the defenseman, I'd talk crap to the goalie, like not actual crap, but like I'd get in their heads, I'd poke them with the stick and then I'd pop out, get boom, goal, behind the back mm -hmm. goal. Like I was that guy. I was annoying on crease for the defenseman because it was just fun for me. So mm -hmm. I was uh, had a full ride for college. Lacrosse, okay. good to go, right? And then junior year, I was one-on-one -on -one with the goalie, defensive behind me, hit me from behind, head kept going, stuck into the ground, body kept going, wrenched my neck, and I didn't remember that point on and the rest of the game, actually the next six months for years. I had a terrible concussion at that point. I got up, apparently. I went on to score another goal, hit someone, then just collapsed. And so... They take me off the field, go to the concussion center and like Pittsburgh. direct back of the head. Uh, so, yeah, whenever I got hit, he pushed me from behind. It was like just my mid back pretty much. Okay. But because of the way my helmet stuck into the ground, because it was a pretty muddy day, the body just kept going and my head just bashed off uh, the side. Yeah, OK. I Anytime your head's bashed around, that brain's moving around, hitting parts it shouldn't be, you know. Um, so six months later, I wake up because the last thing I remember was one on one with the goal. So I wake up. I'm like, oh, did I get the goal? And I stop and I'm laying in my bed. It's a really dark room. Holy because remember, crap. Concussion therapy is basically dark room, do nothing, which are the two worst things you can do. <laughs> yeah, I've only and, had minor ones in wrestling, nothing like that. But like it was a dark room for about two months. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, oh, do nothing. It's like, okay, more neural atrophy. Cool. That's even worse. Uh, <laughs> so I'm laying in bed, right? And again, high school at this time. So a little bit of stubble, but nothing crazy. 
and I feel I got I got more stubble than ever. And I feel my rib cage. And like I felt like I lost like 20, 30 pounds. I go to get up out of bed and I'm like shaking. Like I remember, like I just couldn't even fire a neuron to save my life. Legs could barely move. I shakily stumble out of my bedroom to get to the bathroom to look myself in the mirror. And I look at myself and I just start crying because I had like a pretty full beard, like the biggest beard I ever had at that age. I lost again 20, 30 pounds and I didn't remember the prior six months. So I was literally in that bed, you know, parents taking care of me and stuff like that for six months or when I able to walk, talk, do anything crazy. And wow. uh, it's scary, dude. It was so scary because like my first thought as a kid is I'm done. Like my whole life yeah. is lost. I was going to go to college for that. I was going to get into nutrition dietetics. Like I had everything figured out. At least I thought I did. And that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Because this is the happened. superhero story on how the neuroplasticity biohacker was born. Right? Yeah. The yeah, little, yeah, little yeah. Came from Mars crawled into my ear when I had that concussion. And that's, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so best friend at the time, we was on the lacrosse team. His brother was getting into bodybuilding. He was kind of getting into bodybuilding. So I decided to kind of get into that because I had to start to rebuild my brain and my body, really. I couldn't remember yeah. how to walk, couldn't remember how to talk. Uh, I couldn't really write or do anything crazy like that. And got into that, got into bodybuilding, and then went to get, uh, got into college doing nutrition dietetics. Hated that because I shadowed Bonnie Tracy, who at the time was working with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And it was mm -hmm. basically her job, and this takes nothing away from her at all, it was basically like you could choose from a meal plan for these athletes and that was it. It wasn't specific, it wasn't- Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, Kiko, Kiko needs the micro specifics, all the variables. Yeah, right, like I wanna know exactly what we're doing when, and there's a time and place to have very broad spectrum goals like that and plans, but with professional athletes and still like that today, like in the NFL, they have Gatorade that they're drinking in between uh, at their practices. There's no essential amino acids in though, there, there's no yeah. chlorine, there's no creatine, there's, all these basic things. And every time I walk with an NFL guy, I'm a like a a ADHD moment. What do you think of prime? Because prime is the hydration drink that is going around, AKA it's sugar water. And yeah, you're all you have a family and the family sees the, you know, the influencer marketing that poison. Like what, what do you think of prime compared to Gatorade compared to how you would hydrate your athletes personally? So there's nothing like, wrong with it. Like, how would a commercial drink, if Keek designed it, what would that look like versus Gatorade versus... I think that Prime is ridiculous, honestly. Like, when you have unlimited money and you see it's set up to, like, just shill and print money to all these kids, it's been very triggering in the metaverse. Like, everyone is taking shots at it. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Again, to me, I believe there's no bad tool. There's just better tools. You know, so to me, the Prime Gator, all that kind of fun stuff, it's kind of just low tier. It's very basic. There's nothing really crazy about it. If you look at all the electrolyte and ionic based drinks on the market, we're trying to look and replace what our body's losing. So sweat isn't just water. There's sodium chloride, which is table salt. There is, we have the so sodium ions, chloride ions, potassium ions, magnesium ions, calcium ions. Those are the five main ones. And they exist pretty much at a pretty good ratio of sodium and potassium being a one to four and then calcium magnesium being basically one to two. So if you had something like a gram of sodium, you'd have like 250 milligrams of potassium and like 500 milligrams of magnesium calcium. Like that right there replaces what you're losing. But then you say, I'm an athlete, what's happening when you're training? Proteolysis, AKA breaking down your muscle tissue. So that's cool because we wanna make an adaptation, but we want to dig a ditch, right? We don't wanna dig a massive hole that we can't recover from. So EAAs would come in and all amino acids are pretty beneficial, mainly the essential amino acid varieties to go ahead and make sure we're blunting that process. So we're not digging a crazy hole we can't recover from, just enough to create an adaptation. So my perfect, go ahead. I was gonna say, could you go into, I'm just gonna spiral you, um, BCAAs versus EAAs because yeah. You see uh, the BCA marketing, look, this is it, this is it. And then years later, everyone's like, EAAs only, EAAs only. So where do you sit on that? So if we look at it in the most basic sense, BCAs would be more anti-catabolism, so stop the breakdown of tissue. Essential amino acids are more anabolism, the growth of muscle mm -hmm. tissue. So it's not that simple, but we can roughly whittle it down to it being simply that. So in reality, a hydrolyzed whey, 10 grams, completes full spectrum is kind of your best case scenario in intra-workout setting. The problem is though, 
of whole protein source can really irritate a lot of people's stomachs, even something like a hydrolyzed whey, and it just doesn't taste good. You're mixing it with carbohydrate powders. So you like have this sweet chocolatey, it's pretty gross. I can't do it. It makes me want to throw up. So instead no. we go, yeah, right? Like what's the next best thing? I like the protein waters, the protein yeah. waters at yeah, IsoPure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those are cool. But yeah, I are agree. Cool. Those shakes, I would, I would, even like, even when I'm bodybuilding, like not being athletic, I'm like, ugh, yeah, if I oh, drink yeah. something during. Can you imagine the running miles or doing rounds <laughs> or doing sprints like with that on your stomach? Like all the sloshing around, that's just terrible. So, yeah, in this kind of scenario, we would ideally like a whole protein source before that, most likely the EAAs, and then after that, most likely BCAs. Because none of them are useless. It's just more what spectrum of goal are you looking for? Mm -hmm. So, again, ADHDing back to Kiko's origin stories. Like, yep. we've now seen that he's interacted with the nutritionist of the Steelers and he was not, you know, nothing, nothing against her, but he was definitely looking for more specifics. Definitely was going to pass her and what he wanted to do. Where did that spiral you towards, you know, Kiko becoming grandmaster Kiko? Like when yep. was it like, okay, I got into bodybuilding. Now I'm going to be the ultimate infant. Like when did the information tool, you know, when did you start pulling for that? It started when I was actually going through that dietetics program. Because in the background, I was always posting on the bodybuilding.com forums. Go back. I was natural pursuit. You could see the thousands of posts I posted up. My workouts, I would illustrate them about how I was thinking at the time. So it would be like really big, bold letters. I'd be like, I'm not going to stop this. Like I was like, mm -hmm. you know, really illustrating how I felt. And my mindset's changed over the years, but that intensity for life and every aspect is still the same. That's just who I am. So I would illustrate my workouts. I'd maybe post up a study here that I post up content and I don't know why I did it. My gut just told me like, just post this stuff. Like it was a, it was, I just felt it. It was the right call to make. Cause then eventually I wanted to do more than that. I wanted to work mm -hmm. with more athletes and that's where it started off. Cause at the same time going through school, I was also being a personal trainer, working at the front desk at the gym, like working crazy hours, training in the middle of the night. Like, you know, the college days when you're sleeping like two hours a night and you just figure it out. Uh, what, yeah, why yeah. Thing? Like we're just grinding together. We both moved into an apartment together during that time frame, and we rent was like five hundred bucks or something. We had three hundred dollars between the two of us, something like that. Mm -hmm. And we're like, we're gonna figure this out. And so we just grinded yeah. together. And the forums really where everything started off because I slowly started working with more natural bodybuilders. Got a lot of amount of initial good success. That's put over into strongman and powerlifters, and then got into the enhanced bodybuilding world. And then it was slowly, honestly, word of mouth, a friend of a friend, because then there'd be some football players, then some basketball, then some cross back to my roots. And then it just mm -hmm. literally blew up from there. I got my master's in performance enhancement injury prevention. And at that point, I was kind of like, okay, I could go for my PhD because I really wanted to. I wanted to work in a human performance research lab, I wanted to teach. I'm like, okay. teaching's fun for me. Yeah, you just to work with athletes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I could quit my job right now, bring the personal trainer, do this whole kind of forum coaching thing, take it full time and just see what happens. I'll give myself a year. Mm -hmm. if I can't pull it off in a year. Fine. Plan B, go back, get my PhD and then pursue something in the academic based world. And that was history. My, my first year at that time, because what do you make a minimum wage? It was like 20 grand a year, like 25, 30, whatever that range is. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like uh, the first year I made a lot more than that off of uh, the online coaching I was doing. I was like, this is cool. Like I loved it more. Mm -hmm. This is what I was meant to do with my life. One of the many things I was meant to do, I was always meant to be a father and a husband, best that's ever lived. I know that in my soul. Mm -hmm. And then I was also supposed to get into this coaching space with athletes, with dysfunctional and every different type of person. And so that's where it started. And, and that's where it kind of just bled over into word of mouth of working with a friend of a friend of a friend. And you hear about this person in the background, then, oh, go reach out to Alex. And I think I, I know that's the only reason why my business has grown to the point it's at today is it's just been all word of mouth, really. Which is one of the best way to refer like a hot client, like the client already like they have that immediate trust of that friend that you are that guy. I did want to. You know, I have a lot of younger, older viewers, viewers that have been following me forever. Like all the older viewers know how difficult it was to get this niche information. Now times have changed to where the kids can be, you know, biohacking, pharma chemist. If you sat there and watched everything on two times speed, like 
you could pretty much get a good baseline knowledge, in my opinion, by 20 years old. Yeah. How are you finding all that information? Because I kind of came in the middle of this. You know, I think of Derek more plates, more dates. You guys, you guys are all in the forums, you know, clacking away at each other, nerding out at each other and trying to figure out which information works, which information doesn't work. When my generation came along, we were pulling from the forms, but we were starting to bring it to the video content where everyone is an armchair pharmacist. Everyone is an armchair doctor, biochemist, blah, blah, blah. You were in the era before that where that information was so fucking hard to accumulate. Can you go into how it was back then to versus the public information now? I'm only 31 years old, by the way. Do you seem that old? I feel like I'm like 50 after that one. Well, I'm just saying this this biohacking thing has exploded. Yeah, right? yeah it's too. It, it's, it's not even comparable. Like you yeah. have kids juicing at 16, oh, yeah. turning pro at 18. Now they got this massive social media following that can generate them 60,000 plus dollars a month. And this bio, ha like, oh, I want to do that. I want. I, I don't want to go to college at all, Kiko. I don't want to get no masters or do any of that. Like, it's really turning into this online race mm -hmm. to build these profiles, and that's built on their accumulation of finding someone like you, or accumulating the knowledge themselves. So, I just want to hear like how it was back then collecting because I would go to forums. I'd be like, what does this person look like? Does yeah. this person even lift? Yeah. Does this person have any muscle? He's writing like 30 paragraphs, all these things. Like, what do you look like? Yeah. And then that changed over time during my my era. Yeah, no, it has. And for me, uh, because I was in academia, I could go to the library, just print stuff out. So like I would print out every study I could find. I, I, I probably cost them so much money in ink because I would just print study after study. I'd go read a good book at the library and then I'd go buy that. I bought, I have so many books. I lost a lot, sadly, because we've moved in two apartments together, married all that fun stuff. Now a new house with the kids gonna move again soon, like we talked about, and um, lost so many books over the years, but it was all books, it was all research papers. And I think the most important thing for me, because now, like you said, age of social media with the internet, you can find anything online. Like I'm the kind of guy who has, because I've done this, I will go through and out read patents on drugs. You can go out and find, like just Google growth hormone patents. Go to actually Google, find those, and you can see the entire process. But what they do in there is they'll put certain verbiage that confuses you, like the skills known to those in the craft. And they'll mm -hmm. leave that out so that you can't really know how to put things together. Or they'll put mm -hmm. extra information there to kind of confuse people. But it's all there. You just have to mm -hmm. slowly pick it apart and figure it out, number one. Number two, I have an account on probably every form you can imagine. I have, because mm -hmm. I was, uh, when I was, uh, <laughs> When I was writing my growth home ebook, I joined some acromegaly forums and I'd mm -hmm. reach out to some of the top posters. I'd say, hey, I'm just curious about what your blood work looks like from an IGF standpoint because I want to see the highs of the highs. And people ignore you and then I say, I'll, I'll pay you for it. Like, I just want to see, you know? And so I've done that with every single forum out there from pregnancy forums to growth hormone forums to you name it, any kind of disease, every kind of sport, everything, everywhere. And I would just offer people money to indirectly learn from them. To look at their blood work, to ask about their experiences. If I ever go to the ER or doctors and there's ever a doctor that I feel like clicks very well, I'll find some way to get his contact information and basically just you know, offer to pay him money for consulting. So like for me, I can never give credit to one person because I feel like I've learned from everyone. For you, I've learned yeah. so many things about the social media one things I need to change with my business to take it to the next level. So to mm -hmm. me, everyone has something to offer. You can have different viewpoints, but it's like, why do you think that? Like we we're talking about the finasteride guy before this, it's like right. responded amazingly for him. So that's awesome. So of course he has that thought process, you know, why is it working good for you? And then, okay, there's a category of people that can't take finasteride or any drug and can't take finasteride or any other drug. People do not respond the same way to everything. And so you find out those people and you figure out what's making them tick. And the problem with that though, in the pharmaceutical biohacking world is none of this stuff in the research is applicable to day-to-day -day application. Was, yeah. Yeah. There's no, I was about to go it. into that. Like we're literally talking about the title of this podcast. The base of the pyramid is very wide with me and Kiko, right? I'll sit there and answer 30 DMS for free just to get the data. Yep. And I did that for six years straight. Just yeah, boom, boom, awesome. boom, 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 boom. 
like I wasn't doing it to sell product. I'm like, I want so many collections of each individual epigenetic reaction just so like I can look at someone's situation. I'm like, well, I could go look at these papers that are skewed to get the drug passed anyways. I could pull a little bit or I have 50 reports of a similar cycle. What happened, you know? And I feel like with you specifically, your ability to database document all your clientele over the years and how you tell me like you have notes on everything like that is so much more important in my mind than building a brand based on well i have it all papered and studied cool it's like an introduction paper like i don't know i come from the computer science world like i study information systems computer science like that's where you create i feel like that was the only reason i was smart was because you would create code and then you go to somebody else's creation but it wasn't like you just pulled the equation and just plopped it on there. You're like, that's the base. I have to create and build it myself. And then some other programmer that's better is going to be like, bro, you could shorten your latency time by like three seconds if you wrote it like this. And that's how computer nerds are so base. Because if the top nerds in the room, like I'd rather just have him critique my code and be embarrassed rather than well, I found it in this book and it was written like this. So that's right. No, no, I don't agree with that, you know? And that's why I like you so much because you spent the time in the shadows building this crazy data pool. And we're about to watch that with you. And it's going to be very, very awesome to see. People be shocked about how much data I've collected and kept over the years. I have. I probably would drive. fucking die laughing. Oh, and, and again, I am very, very honest and open with everyone I work with. If anyone asks me not to say anything about their name, about our relationship together, whatever, I never use names for stuff like that, unless if they're okay with it. Because there's a lot of people yeah. who information can't be out there, whether they're a high-ranking CEO, a different pro athlete, or they're just, you know, Sally down the street who doesn't want their name associated mm -hmm. with me. Because I get it. I post up about a lot of different things, you know? And people don't like being out there on the internet, putting themselves out there. So I more than get it. But... I have chart upon chart, graph upon graph of everything I've ever done. And it was as simple. And every every coach out there or everyone out there, if you're just trying to get this base going, if you're working with these athletes, every response you see from a person, have it at check-in time, copy paste, logged into a file. Like, oh, we added 200 milligrams of Primo. And all of a sudden libido goes down and joints start to hurt and feeling a little mentally foggy. Oh, this person responds well to the estrogen management of that prima ball or some of the downstream prima ball and mm -hmm. uh, metabolites that'll manage estrogen. Put that over there into their data file and then put that into another file that says how many people are responding to primo from this aspect in terms of managing estrogen. And that's all I've done. And that takes five seconds, copy paste. But then every week or every couple of weeks you go through, you can pile it all. Doing it at pace. That's what exactly. makes you goaded is like you did it at a vicious pace and like being in data and stuff. Like once you have that, I know you sit on that data and you're like, you know, oh, once, I, once you see I it all there, you, so you, just can, yeah. <laughs> you can just literally pull from anything like how has your coaching evolved? Like, did you have imposter syndrome? Because like you went on, in my opinion, and I'll say this and not gas up Kiko. Like, I think he's in like the top 10 as far as like, you can come to him with anything. You don't have to be just a bodybuilder. I've read all his case reports public on his Instagram, which you can read as well. Crazy recoveries, crazy reversals of stuff outside of bodybuilding. How did that manifest? Because, you know, you're just getting in, you're, you said, you oh, the football player, I died at him. And like, how to get to a point where people are coming to you with like the most complex issues that, again, Big Pharma legally can't solve. But you're saying you're connecting the dots outside the box. Like, when, when did it start moving towards that? Straight from the beginning, because it goes back to the word of mouth conversation we were having. One older woman who, because her daughter I helped just lose fat to do a bikini show mm -hmm. and then help this older black lady. Awesome girl. We were fixing a couple different health problems, fixed her. And she said, "Yo, you got to talk to my son. He's, you know, really big in sport where he's a really good athlete. I was like, oh, cool. And he reaches out. He's like this big name NFL player. And I was like, kind of more than just like a decent athlete. Like she was really underplaying who he was. <laughs> and then from there, it, it's literally that it was that word of mouth of going from mm -hmm. a bikini competitor to her grandmother, mother, whatever, no grandmother. Um, and then to her son. And so it's like this whole kind of spectrum of networking that just grew in the background. And then 
with social media again because I don't I post a lot of stuff, but I don't do things to get views or likes. I don't know how many followers I have. Right. I don't know how many comments yeah. I have. Like to me, those are for me they were useless metrics because I always looked at how many people I was working with and how good of a job I was doing. I stopped tracking how many clients I have because once I start feeling stressed, like I've said this before, if I can't train twice a day and be every bit of the best dad and father I can be, or yeah, dad, husband, um, then that's the day I'll stop taking on clients because I clearly am taking on too much business. And I've never hit that yet. So I got away from those metrics and was focusing on just that background work. And for me, the whole imposter syndrome thing never really happened. I've always just been having fun with it. Like as lame as that sounds, it's just like every second of my life is fun. I never saw it as anything more than that. Like this is just one of the things I was born to do. And I have so much fun with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, it was definitely like you had all that time to be retracted and low pace and very much about organization. For me, it was at the front lines, like trigger pull, trigger pull, trigger pull. And it was always me trying to accumulate my knowledge while I'm competing against pure entertainer influencers who, who don't need knowledge. Yep. So it was like me, like long term, I want to be closer to Alex because that's future proof. I can get that brain. That's future proof. But I also had to stay hot. I had to stay relevant. So for me, it turned into like, oh, at 21, my my DM box has, you know, a thousand plus messages of each like thing and like. That's it was not. getting to a point where like I didn't feel like I had the knowledge base and was just like a young kid and wanted to build that knowledge base in the background, but I couldn't. Yeah. I was already flowing. That's yeah. what makes you so interesting because you've had that time in the shadows and now it's time to reveal when the armor is built and the suit is built. And like that that that's like what I wish I did, honestly. I wish I either was like no, this is all about me, pure entertainment. Like, I'll do a little bit of educational stuff, but I don't feel like I was putting in the amount I needed because I was redlined. Like, you you know how it is. Like, you are just working all day. I have a very long-term 10-year relationship that I do not feel like just sacrificing the queen to just work forever. Like, personally, that's not what I like to do. And I built a lot of spelling in that relationship. And it was very much, like, for me getting this brain has always been very problematic with doing stuff in the front end. That's why I think our combination, me showing you the world of like, I think you could like, you could do as many clients you want at whatever price you want within three years. And I feel like you will be expanding onto really innovative stuff. That's going to help people really suffering. Like I really tip your hat for jumping in the fire of the PFS stuff. I don't want to go too much into it on this podcast because as you both know, very controversial when it comes to the amount of suffering that I personally suffered because I personally had it, but just the jarringness of coming in there with information that's pretty much dead on what they're suffering from. But it's like, can you really help them at the end of the day with the political pressures around that? You were one of the ones like, screw it. These people need help. And we got the information out there and I can't tell you how many people have thanked me for putting you on my channel. So many people like from the bottom of their, their hearts, like, That's cool. and that takes a special person because most people, I'm not going to name names. I had really, really big brain opinions weigh in on it. A lot of people won't say, you know, a theoretical solution and will bash me and Kiko for being like, Hey, I don't have the finite data points, but I tried this, 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 and this, and it really seems like this. And in my reversal, it played like this. I don't think we'll absolutely know unless, you know, Kiko gets the lab and funds that <laughs> has his own biochemist one day. But it was like one of those things where when I saw you do that, I'm like, oh yeah, this is a big separation compared to all the other opinions I had weigh in on it. I really do appreciate that, man. I'm, I'm I'm very thankful I could help so many people out in that world. And in terms of everyone else who weighed in, different opinions, wrong opinions, like whatever the stance Oh, I appreciated is. all the data. Exactly. It was yeah. like yep. certain people will not say something unless they finitely know based on data points. Yeah. That data is real shit. You know, it's a yeah. weird nuanced disease. Oh, yeah. So you yeah. got to start. Devil's advocate, though. 
in this age of social media, everything is study and scientific based. So it's starting to kind of move away from just sheer experience. And some people are bleeding over into if it's not being proven in a study, then it doesn't matter. And that's not everyone, but that's a, that's a pretty popular opinion, right? And then a lot of these mm -hmm. people have much bigger names and brands than I do and you do and everything. Like mm -hmm. there's so many other things where if they say something wrong, that could be the difference in how much extra money per month or less, or that could be losing deals with this person, that person. And it's not to say it's right or wrong, but I get where they're not weighing in on certain things. You know what I mean? Like it, mm -hmm. it's tough because everyone has their own things in the background. That's why I never judge anyone anymore. It was like, when I was younger, I, I was the typical kind of jock, cocky, arrogant womanizer guy. And then you get older, you start mm -hmm. to mature, get a wife, get kids, and you really soften up, or at least I did for the better. And it's mm -hmm. like everyone has their own things going on in their lives. They have their own agendas. And so, like, I can't fault anyone for saying the wrong things. I've said wrong things over the years. I'm sure I'm saying wrong things in this podcast. I just don't know what they are because I don't have but that. But they're based opinions. We're making yeah, based yeah. opinions, you know? Yeah, like exactly. that. We were, we were talking about cartooners before we got on and like yeah. I have the best cartooner in Pittsburgh in my opinion and like I'll ask him like hey can my transmission handle a thousand horsepower and he's like I think so based we'll on his other builds but yeah. you go look up the manufacturer and they're, they're not going to tell you any of that yeah they're not going to tell that, you how the much they over engineered example. the shit yep that's somebody gotta find reason. out all right let's jump into Kiko's topics that he picked. The only milligram that matters is your own. This is funny right now. <laughs> so on TikTok, I know Kiko's like completely out of all this garbage social media. There's there's a big argument. There's people saying, oh, I take TRT only. They're taking grams. There's other guys like, those people are lying. I'm taking grams. Then you have boom, boom, like what's right, what's wrong. And now you have a skew of young kids thinking and i never use big dosages and like i'll tell you every single cycle i did you have a lot on the table to work with me personally right i saved it i don't know your opinion on that but you have a big push in these young kids thinking that they need 1.5 to 2.5 grams of gear within the first you know two three years of cycling to move the needle personally i'm sitting here at 271 in the morning wanting to do classic yeah. And, you know, I haven't used anything, you know, I was going to wait for it to get a coach like you and you would have all this horsepower to push me in my competitive career. I didn't see a point of like, oh, I got to juice myself to the max. I just slowly crept up to 270. What's and your opinion awesome. on that? Yeah. So that title, that topic of the only milligram that matters is your own. If we take the far end spectrum of IFBB pros, I've. You know, you're friends with them, you work with them, you talk in the back with other coaches, whatever. There are certain pros out there taking two grams, three grams, five grams, 10 grams, 15 grams, and then vials every day where they don't even count milligrams. But at that level, the reason why it's such a broad spectrum is because the majority do not get negative side effects. As mm -hmm. odd as that sounds, there's a lot of them out there on eight grams, 10 grams that I've been a part of, or other coaches have been a part of, and the coaches get bastardized but these guys, literally their EGFRs improve. Their ASTLT mm. improves. We're getting, we're checking everything from QT intervals, different cardiac scans, like everything is improving. They're getting healthier while they're on cycle. That's not to justify high doses being safe because long-term you're gonna have to pay for it at some point. Like we're not saying that. Abusing any drug is going to cause health consequences long-term if you don't see it in the short-term because calcium scores slow going up in the background year to year, like things like that you have to measure. But these guys don't get negative side effects. A lot of them can take a lot and get very little negatives. Other people can take so little and they get a massive response. So for that, it's not a matter of which coach or which athlete is abusing drugs. It's what they need. Whittle that down all the way now to the first time person who's going to be introducing their first cycle or something like that. You can't start off with that high of a milligram because you don't know your response yet. So to me, there's nothing wrong with working things up to a gram, two, three, four, five, whatever, but you have to put in your due diligence and start low to know your response. Because what if you took 300 milligrams of testosterone and you grew like a weed, but you also then took you know an extra thousand. You put an extra thousand on top because, oh, I'm growing well at three, let's see what a thousand does. You get yeah. the edema, yeah, blood yeah, pressure yeah. problems, yeah, all these problems, and then performance goes down, you start losing muscle tissue because you can't train hard because the lower back comes from the estrogen. 
So we're mm-hmm. trying to find everyone's response. It's called anabolic mapping. Dan Duchesne brought it up how many years ago, and everyone mm-hmm. should still be doing it to this day, where you're going through a trial and error period of this compound, this dosage, how do I respond? Washout period of TRT, cruise, whatever you want to call it, same kind of thing. Again, it's slowly built over time. Certain people will realize really early on if they're hypo or hyper responders. So a hypo responder would be someone like me for testosterone. I could take 600 milligrams of testosterone, all negatives. And testosterone on blood work, not that it matters for mm-hmm. anabolism purposes, but it could be like 700 milligrams per deciliter, which that's a terrible ratio. Like Right, yeah, that, that, that's a horrible score. Yeah, right? And so I literally can't handle more than 100 milligrams of testosterone or the estrogen burden from that specific variety causes me problems. I get acne. I just don't feel good. It does not respond well in my physiology. But nandrolone, growth hormone, I could push those like crazy. I, I don't anymore. Mm-hmm. But my response from doing my, ma- my mapping over the years was always nandrolone and the DHT. Those are always very easy on my physiology. But again, you don't know that until you try. Because at the same mm-hmm. time, there's nothing wrong with testosterone. There's a lot of guys out there that can go all testosterone up to a gram, higher than a gram, two grams. They're staying at a couple hundred milligrams and they add their other compounds on top to drive the expression of protein, stuff like that. But again, it only matters on you. So are you a hyper right. or, or hypo responder to one drug and then to the total milligrams as a whole? So people just have to figure that out because there's nothing wrong with an 18 year old if they've been, we'll say they started 16, right? They do this process, they realize, wow, I am just not responding well to these lower dosages. I go higher and I'm responding well all of a sudden. I hate to say because you don't want to give anyone of that age direct. No, 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 we're being based. We're exactly. be- this is the yeah. whole title of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if that's you and you find out you're just that much of a hypo responder, then slowly work up the dose. Don't go straight to a couple grams, but add an extra couple hundred milligrams per cycle and see how you respond. The caveat, and this obviously goes out every, uh, before anything we say, you have to do everything in the background first. Training, nutrition, sleep, stress management, everything needs to be a thousand percent. Then you layer the drugs. Then you start to really build the machine up from there. Yeah, that's that they're they're missing that. You know, again. Drugs matter. If you ever bored on if you ever bored on TikTok, just go on it's called Gear Talk. Okay. It's like the Roid part. And again, the information is, you know, beyond shit quality. But I, I do agree with that to a certain extent. I'll go into hypo and hyper responder with a just a question from me is like over time, is there a way to make yourself respond better? Is there been protocols that you have done where like you've seen better response over time? Because for me personally, I, I've used low dosages and I'm 270 with veins in my lats and you have tons more options with me. And I personally think I got there because my best friend was Natty, like 250, 17 years old, squawing 500 pounds for reps. So when I saw like, oh, my compound movement volume needs to be like that. And I'm some little ass computer nerd, you know, (laughs) I'm like, I'm starting to creep there before I start throwing gear in there. And I feel like that has helped me get to this physique and still have so much left on the table versus, yeah, you could have training, right? But I just feel like a lot of people neglect like Ronnie Coleman's quote, like somebody got to lift that damn heavy weight, like somebody got to put on the big weight yep. and you could be some farmer boy fat for a while, cut it up, maintain the strength, then add gear after. Yeah. If you are a hypo or hyper responder, what are the variables that is causing that primarily and could you alter them? Primarily, um, if we want to really get deep into the weeds with like the different esterases that will cleave these drugs. So we have, mm-hmm. let's say testosterone molecule, right? We have those four different rings up in that 17th position. That's where the ester attaches. The phosphodiesterase like 7B and a couple other ones will come in, cleave it off of there and allow you to utilize your actual free hormone, taking away the ester and all that kind of cool stuff. That's one of a dozen factors, but depending on that esterase activity for you specifically, it could be why you are a hyper or hyper responder. Then you get into the androgen receptor conversation that we've had before, where is there a genetic problem with your CAG repeat? So you have that DNA binding domain, we have that hinge region, ligand binding domain, which spectrum of are you having problems at? The issue is those are things we can kind of influence, but not really like the esterase thing, you can't really influence that that much. The androgen receptor thing, you can't. If you, the more muscle tissue you have, the more androgen receptors you have to create architecture. If we go ahead and also increase androgen load, going back to the higher dose conversation, that'll also create 
nutrient receptors. You get into the L-carnitine conversation, you get into finding which drug you respond best to and what happens, better response, more insulin receptors, better overall growth, right, from every single aspect in Cascade. So over time, you most definitely can. What you said about the training is so true because I know like for me, I couldn't grow a body part, like my arms took so long to grow because in reality, training wasn't that good. Like I would get pumped, but I just, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. you come to the conclusion, you're like, wait a second, I have been like sucking training this for years. Yeah, but you know, in like, my mind at the time, I'm like, I'm training so hard. Mm. Training arbitrarily hard means nothing to do with progress. Right. And, and that's where like, I give a lot yeah. of credit over to like the N1 guys and all the guys in like the biomechanics field because that's not my field at all. But some of their content and just learning some of the biomechanics, yeah. stuff, it's so important for exercise selection. So go to those guys first if you could, if you're mm -hmm. natural. Learn how to train first, then start layering all the compounds because it's happening for me now. It's like I'm starting to train better and all of a sudden I'm growing better and mm -hmm. things are lower for me. But a lot of these pros, and this is also the difference right, between hyper and hypo responders. The pros being the hyper responders, they could have the worst form in the world, but they stimulate so many more myocytes, so muscle cells, so many more satellite cell changes and everything than we can normally. So like their one bicep curl is more trauma and growth in that one single rep than I probably get in the whole workout for my biceps. And they're hyper responding from that. And that's where the spectrum of genetics is so interesting. So depending on where you're at, you could be right in the middle where you're just kind of like an average moderate responder. And for mm -hmm. the majority of things, that's where I kind of sit as well, where it's like we have to do so many different things, but the hyper responders can do so many things wrong and still progress. But that mm -hmm. doesn't take away anything from what they're doing. They all I, I think the name comes to mind is Branch yeah. Warren and I love Branch Warren. I met yeah. Branch Warren in person. And if you would tell some like science nerd that's, you know, I study train like, you go watch him and he's Argh! like, yep. personally, I know that training works for him. Mm -hmm. Like, I know See, that yeah. my state he's in. I know how much he's activating. But then you go talk to this is another thing. There's science based lifting, which like what what the fuck does that even mean? Because science is always like moving around. Right. The yeah. science based lifting 20 years ago is not the science based lifting now. And then you see Branch Warren, who's an Olympian use none of that it's exactly like you said his one set where he's screaming you know summoning all the chi yeah. would be worth five sets of me just like one yeah two like i do really think that is something that people have no idea because like when people want to go on steroids i'm like all right let me watch you train i'm like you want to take this risk of modifying all your biomarkers you better come in here on the gym floor on like focus samurai you know, bull in the china shop kill mode type energy. Otherwise, why are you juicing? Why? And that's the thing, like those pros, they are the guys eating 8,000 calories a day that no one else can do. They're the guys making sure they get eight, 10 hours of sleep every night where no one else can. That's their sole goal. So those guys, they're doing things that are right for them. So we can't look at people that are not hyper responders, doesn't so have yeah, we can't look at that and say, I need to train like them or drug like them because I'm not them. I may not be able to handle like I personally, and I know so many people that are in this moderate responder to hyper responder world to where you couldn't even fathom taking multiple grams because you would just have problem after problem after problem. The most I've taken in the past was right around three grams. And that was for a short period of time. Go, go, go into what that was like, because that's I think the most I've ever taken is 1.8 for like yeah. a week. So, so this what was, was like was, on three grams? So I was getting ready for the 2020 Arnold Classic. Uh, this was right before COVID. It was actually a crazy story. Um, I was working with a coach, and we slowly worked out my doses and everything. A good friend, Project Chavez, a good friend of mine. And at that time, we were just slowly working up, and everything is obviously a discussion back and forth to make sure everyone's in line with their goals. And I wanted to push it. I wanted to see if I could finally redeem myself from that terrible Arnold Classic showing because I am the world's worst competitive bodybuilder, and I just – I, whatever happened well, you, you you told me your story in the background yeah. that was there was a lot going on it wasn't like you were just lasered on that there yeah still it doesn't that. matter it only matters how yeah. you look on show day you know so i'll be the first yeah. person to say worst competitive bodybuilder out there i'm cool with that i'll own that you know but yeah i was pushing things up that prep i had shredded glutes like i was looking really lean not that like big at all but for me i was in the 
210 range, something like that. And I'm 5'8", so not really filled out, but strided glutes, like strided erectors. Like I looked really shredded at a couple weeks out. And then whole life, I've always had acid reflux GERD, which I didn't figure out until later was caused by uh, my gallbladder. And because of mm -hmm. all the systemic stress of that prep and obviously pushing insurance higher, gallbladder went a couple weeks out. So went, got that whole process done. They actually screwed up and the anesthesiologist misdosed me on the table and I actually ended up crashing. And so like I woke up after the surgery, they didn't complete it obviously. And they had told Lindsay, my wife, they're like, we don't know if he's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life because I had this crazy crash that happened out of nowhere and waking up and having them tell her that and seeing her crying was like, I was like, this is never happening again. Whether it was my fault or not, doesn't matter. This will never happen again. And so went through, got called butter out, no problem. One week later after I got home, COVID happened. Shutdown happened, and it was the best thing that could have happened to my family. Because me and Lindsay would take walks every day, we'd talk about it, and ever since then, I've never taken more than my HRT. Because my goals in life are family, work, then my fitness stuff. So I'm still pushing my own bodybuilding goals, but I'm not taking more than HRT off, some peptides in the background, like some cool things we'll talk about later on. But I mean, mm. it's not worth it to me. I've been working to add years to my life, and I'm trying to balance everything out very well, just because of that. And then ever since that 2020 event happened, I slowly realized that like, I got to be a better person in general. You know, I need to be better for my wife, better for my children. At that time, we just had my daughter, just better to everyone, just to be a better human being in society. And I really hit my stride in 2022. And that's where like, I feel like the new Alex was created or for me, like one of my best versions of always being positive. Your firmware I got updated. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. exactly it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, so going back to that prep, though, that was the highest I had pushed up. But again, it's like my response to that was what most people would get a response out of with like 800 milligrams. And I had to push hard for that. And again, I was still getting some negative side effects. So like I'm just, my body's not built to take a lot of that abuse answering wise. So I know I could never turn pro and I'm cool with that because I can't risk that kind of health for me. And you finitely know. It's not like, oh, like you already walked the walk and you're like, I walked the walk. Yep. You know, I did it. I know you can't say I Alex didn't walk the walk. He walked it. You just heard it. Trembolone, the Trembolone sandwich, the only steroid that works on TikTok. I wanted to get Alex Kekel's opinion on Trembolone because it's demonized. In my opinion, being based, there's nothing that really compares to it from a competitive standpoint. We have a lot of individuals. You know, the prolactin neurochemistry skew, the brain damage. I have a guy in my personal LA fitness. I'm like, wait, you've been cruising on trend for three years? You know, go you into <laughs> the most infamous steroid ever. We're going to get this topic over with because everyone talk about trend, talk about trend. Like I've talked about trend so much on this channel. I want to Kiko's take on trend and personally the most he's ever tolerated. I think the most I ever did was like 600 ace and match that with the bipolar and yeah i don't want to talk to no one all day i i didn't have no ego no anger but i was like didn't didn't want to talk to anyone completely emotionless other yeah. people i've seen we had one guy take trend and he shows up the next day i'm like what happened giant black guy uh -huh. i'm like dude you go out last night i'm like you're not a fighter what were you doing shoving people around <laughs> like you know was. how has your experience with trend evolved over the years when yeah. you became this competitive coach so first of all, I love trend because I love every bit of pharmacology out there. It's always person situation specific. So if we look at trend, quick little crash course, if we look at the neurological side of things, we see that firing of the amygdala, we see that downstream atrophy of the prefrontal cortex, and all of a sudden you have someone who's generally more angry and making poor decisions. And that's the new habitual process that they start forming, right? And the problem with that statement though is that doesn't happen to everyone. So 50% right. of people will get that kind of amygdala firing response. And generally, if you're more of a hothead, have some neurochemical-based problems already, like ADHD or bipolar or whatever, you're the mm -hmm. worst candidate for it because your neurochemistry is already skewed up for that. Right. Other yeah. side of things, I've had a lot of the pros who will take a gram of trend and they get chilled, they get relaxed, they get more happy. Like They don't get that response. But a lot of people that don't respond well to it from a neurological standpoint will just get angry and start starting all of the problems that affect that from there. Now, Trenbolone as a whole is super interesting. The reason why it's so novel, and I've talked about this for years, I don't think anyone's really talked about it other than me. Hopefully they have, I'm not sure because I don't follow people, but it's the oxytocin cascade. 
So Trenbolone will drive up oxytocin levels dramatically. I forget the specific number, it's a pretty crazy amount. And oxytocin is this thing that can drive up a lot of satellite cell interactions. It will drive the biotransformation process to create new myocytes from adipocytes. So literally, satellite cell pulls energy from fat cells to create muscle cells. So the recomping effect is mainly coming from that massive driver on oxytocin. So no matter what, we're getting that driver on oxytocin. You're getting the management of glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids, the stress things that cause you to break down too much muscle tissue, not store glycogen, things like that. It manages those extremely well. It drives up. Whenever I say baseline protein, translation, transcription, that's just anabolism. Like that's just building muscle. It's that process of going through those nuclear cascades to build muscle tissue. That's all it is. Trend does that to such a high degree because of what's called in the pharmacopoeia world intrinsic efficiency. That's just how that ligand, trend below that molecule, binds the receptor, how hard it binds, how many signals it sends, the strength of those signals, then how easily it will undock, go find another receptor with that whole process again of dimer forming and all that kind of cool stuff. So trends in that exotic category because of that effect at the receptor base level. So on paper, it's awesome. It has a lot of negative effects, but in reality, everything does if you're a poor candidate for it. So this is why going back to starting low and working up, if you are a coach out there and you have a pro that comes to you and he's like, I've taken this in the past, 405, whatever, 100 milligrams, I respond good, cool. They already did their anabolic map and you can dose them high. Mm -hmm. If you're a first time trend blown user or the younger kids are us utilizing it in today's day and age, start low. Like you can mm -hmm. literally start off with trend ace, 50 milligrams a week, 25 yep. milligrams a week, like work yeah. up and see how you respond. Personally, for me, I feel terrible on it. I would, cause going back to the acid reflux and those problems, I actually had uh, Barrett's esophagus. So you get actual scar tissue lining. I had to reverse that, which I reversed that 100%, very proud about that. And part of that was uh, just getting more acid reflux and taking trend. So for me personally, I can't respond well to it, but I'm a pretty poor responder in general. So I only got up to a couple hundred milligrams of ACE. And one more thing, which is pretty cool. Trend is very different based on the ester application. So we go into that, cause I would like to learn. Yep. So it has to be because this is where we get into the weeds of just guessing pretty much having an educated guess. Going back to molecule 17th carbon, uh, attaching the ester, esterases, coming in cleaving, that process is different with the trend bone molecule than any other androgen out there. Because we can take the acetate ester and we always see more growth, we see more fat loss, we see more everything. Also, neurology goes up, whether it be good or bad. You could have more atrophy of the prefrontal cortex, more amygdala firing, so even more of an a-hole. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it can really affect things to that big of a degree. Trend and anthate, even though it's a long ester, because going back to basic ester numbers, long esters over time will accumulate at a higher actual dosage, or rather it'll accumulate to a higher blood plasma level, even at the same dosage. And then you got to take into account the carry oil. We'll talk about that later. But acetate is almost always the preferred option because it's just giving you that much more of an effect. But if you are someone who responds poor to the neurological side of things, maybe go with the enanthate. So if you try acetate first, because quick in, quick out, right? If you see negative side effects, pull it out. Maybe you should try out the enanthate to see if maybe you get less stimulation on the negative mental side effects. And what about parabolin? Because there's infamacy about the hex being the best. I don't any, see that in application. In? Yeah, I really don't see that in application. I see an actual application, the acetate being the preferred, and then from there, probably going with the enanthate. Uh, the blends generally in my world cause a lot of inconsistencies, and I'm big on consistency. We want to make sure we know exactly what we're doing, how we're responding, and how we're cleaving and dismantling these drugs. So most of the time, if I had to pick, like obviously some people, you got to work with what they can supply and source, but the majority of the time, it's usually acetate. And... How does it impact you neurologically? Because, again, dude, I've I've been a wrestler for a very long time, ranked wrestler. A lot of my friends went on to be D1, D2. I've had the blessing of rolling with them, and they've given the nerd the power to beat the fuck out of anyone. You know, like, it always is funny. I can be this nerd and, like, totally forget that that's there, and there's a lot of nerds out there that have that switch. I notice when I take trend, like, it's like I'm preparing for a fight the whole day where I actually I don't get angry. I just get stupid antisocial yep. where other people get heated up. Like, where do you sit on that? Because you're like this crazy, like academia guy. And then you're adding in that trend. Like, what does it do for you mentally? I think people don't realize where I came from personally. 
Um, going back to my past history, like how I was raised, the person I was, I'm not who I am today. I was an a I was a terrible person. I would really start so many fights and treat people so poorly. Like, I was a bully all through school. Like, I hate mm. saying it now because I'm like so disappointed in some of the choices I made, and I get it. Kids, will, kids will was be it a parenting standpoint, or are you just figuring out yourself? Yeah, so background with my family, quick synopsis, we'll go into it more in depth later if you guys want to talk about it, but it was essentially dad basically raised me to be just like him, which was, I because I had a great childhood until I kind of realized what was really going on in the background, and uh, father was very much, you go into a room, you pick out who you can beat up, who you can't, you always are the dominating person, you're always like oh, the alpha, yeah. you yeah. have to be the alpha, yeah. and I was raised like that, and again, I'm still a person, I made my own decisions, but I was like that the majority of my life. So back then, because I haven't taken it, and again, probably, actually since 2020 was the last time, I still wasn't that good of a person then. I was still slightly that alpha male mentality where it was like, mm. you know, no one can make a joke about me. No one could say anything about me. I did all the boxing, so I got in a lot of street fights, and I was pretty good. You know, I could take a mm. hit. I could not get hit. I always just had natural power. My hands were always heavy, mm. as people like to say. Um, and so that just made me worse. People got that dynamite. Yeah, pretty much, you yeah. know, that straight overhand, like it was always pretty strong. My left mm. was always pretty strong and I was really good with my movement. Like I could, I could bob and weave, like no one's hit me in a fight. And so I'd be the mm. cocky guy, hands down in a street fight, you know, like, go ahead, go ahead. And they miss mm. it. And you go overhand cause I, I wish you, I wish I could see this version. Yeah, no, you don't this know. Is a, this is a, this uh. is a paradox flip. This is a paradox flip, it seems like. But I like being so honest about it because it's like, I feel like I made a complete switch in who I was when I realized I didn't like I was the person, uh, the person I was becoming, essentially. Yeah. You know, because like, I always had a good heart. I always wanted to be a good person. But going back to how I was raised with my father specifically, I feel like that aggressive tendency was just fostered. I was always taught to be, I was rewarded when I was that alpha guy and beating people up. Mm. And it's like, or being the womanizer, like, I can't stand that now. It's like, really? Like I was like that at one point, you know? Yeah. yeah. So trend did not like, respond well with me. Cause I was more of that, <laughs> you know? It's so weird. Like it, like it, it just makes me anti. So I don't get any aggression. Like I just become this like recluse Scrooge type character. Do you get but like for me, for, for my wrestling career, like when I started, I won one match my first year, you know, you become Sigma real quick in Western Pennsylvania. Like, I remember my first three matches, first period, maybe 40 seconds I last, because that's how Pennsylvania is. Like, yeah. if you are in Pennsylvania and you're a rank wrestler, like, we have people from other states come be like, oh, I was number one in South Carolina. I just got yeah. 14th. We're like, yeah, this is why we're all, like, crazy here. You know, <laughs> like, I, I learned very quickly that the, the hierarchy of martial arts Oh yeah! Like I, I had to grind my way up, and it was like one of those things where I, I needed that outlet for my bipolar to control my frequency. Like I had very good coaches, and I yeah. still thank them to this day for me being able to just use martial arts to turn that on, turn that off. Yeah. And I, I just want to say that because my followers think I'm this cocky wrestler. It's like no, like you can't take that mad time away from me. You can't take my friends grinding that into me away from me and like I, I can stand on that i did not know kika was a boxer now i gotta see this boxing footage <laughs> you have any footage i'd have to go back and find it because i originally made uh when i was going to again apply for college were you a conventional or a southpaw mostly both i was always ambidextrous okay i switched okay it, go, what's going on and then straight left yeah. and boom straight between like I was, uh -huh. it was cool. It was so much fun. My footwork was always good. I was always a beast. Even now, a jump rope. I get shin splints because I'm 250. But if I do it long yeah. enough, I just you know get through the actual shin splints. You get over that hump, and then jump rope's pretty cool. I could do the crosses. I could just go for hours. You know, not hours. Uh -huh. All right, back to bodybuilding. Sight enhancement oil. So I've used sight enhancement oil. I personally had pretty good results in my rear delts. Yep. You go online giant controversy around sight enhancement oil you know you have people saying it's gonna ruin your muscle you're gonna have deformed muscles i don't know if you know boston lloyd r.i.p but You're really good friends boston oh go into your relationship i've only had like two conversations with him so how was your experience with boston he's been an exceptional guy to me super polite didn't have to be polite to me i was like kind of being an asshole like you said you know i was kind of like fuming he diffused it boom 
I have not, not one bad thing to say. I respect his extreme honesty, his extreme ability to be that transparent. And I just wish he was still here personally. Apologize for getting emotional. Um, we were talking the day before he passed, and the next day I was on a call like this. I was a consult call with someone, and they said, oh, did you hear about Boston? I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I was waiting for him to text me back, and he's like, he passed. And it was just, I started crying on that call. So it's like the same situation as here, so it just gets me. Um, people don't know who he really was. The whole calling people out, that was all to build a business. He called me out. We were friends. He made fun of me all the time publicly and behind the scenes. Like, we were great friends. We only talked about family stuff, some bodybuilding stuff here and there. I disagree with him on a lot of things. He disagreed with me on a lot of things. It's cool. No big deal. Like, we're still really good friends. And uh, lo losing him was just shocking because we had just talked the night before. And I checked my phone to see if he responded to me before I had the call. And you find out. So that was tough. I think it was a week before for me was my call. And, like, having his energy come into my life and like the triple OG giving me the chops. And, you know, like, like you said, like he, he was a beefer, but it was, it was just bro shit, you know? And honestly, and, he was naturally so funny. He was gifted from that comedic gene. Yeah. So it's like, he said some things about me and I can't remember what they were, but they were funny. Like I couldn't help uh, but laugh. And like, he was entertainment. Uh -huh. and he used that entertainment to build a business to provide for his family. So he wasn't a bad person at all. He was a great human being. And the person that he portrayed online was just that. And, you know, if he was still alive today, you couldn't say this because that's still the persona that had to be there, you know, but given these past, it's kind of like, you can be honest about, no, that was, that was literally just to go ahead and make money for his family. And I get that everyone has to provide. Mm -hmm. He was big on site enhancement oil. He was the first guy, obviously he had a business around it, but he's not the first guy that had a business around it. So I didn't think yeah. it was like a straight shill thing, but he was the first one to be like, stretching the fascia actually works, actually creates new tissue. I remember I was younger. I didn't have the knowledge I had now. And I'm like, stretching the fascia, like that sounds like some fucking pseudo ass bro <laughs> science that doesn't work. Yeah. And I don't know if you know Tony Huge from Enhanced Athlete, but yeah. he was taking a lot of advice from Boston. You know, he was really getting into the sign enhancement stuff, had a lot of good results, putting it under his biceps. I wanted to go into your opinion, working with professionals on the fuck ups with sign enhancement oil, how you would do it, which one you would use. Obviously no, you know, no direct affiliations, but what kind of blend you would use. Oh, I'll go and into direct go in. If you don't mind, I don't care. Yeah, yeah, no, I just want to get the Kiko like boom, like yeah, all the yeah. information. Yeah. So SEOs are absolutely awesome and at the top level of bodybuilding and not even top level, but gym rats, amateurs, national competitors, like the majority of people, maybe not the majority, but a lot of people are utilizing them, but they're doing them right. If you use these SEOs right, you can't tell. Where things go wrong are the people injecting products that have a high amount of uh, dynamic viscosity. So very poor oily substances like the polyethylene glycols, the glycols, the glycols, all those things that just drive sheer systemic inflammation, you know, or they're doing the mineral oils and things like that, that it's, they're doing like 20, 30, 50 cc's every single day. Like, right. yeah, like where people would do uh, Vaseline, they would melt down Vaseline and shoot that in. Like, no, we're talking about oils or like a hyaluronic acid water-based substance because there's two different camps here. So the oil ones are my preferred for long-term actual muscle growth. The hyaluronic acid ones are more for that short-term acute change. You get an awesome pump, awesome change to fullness. I see the oils being slightly better for long-term progress, but you can run into more potential problems with muscle tissue fibrosis if you abuse it. You know, whereas the hyaluronic acid ones, water's dispersion easy, they pull in fluid, they do a really good job as well. So in the oil-based world, and again, keep in mind again, we're figuring this out. This is never going to be found in any study. Right. There's right, one of right. three ways that they're working because I've had bodybuilders and bodybuilders over the forms over the years have gotten MRI scans on the muscles. They've did SEO products, wait for the oils to clear, and you don't see any kind of oily deposit, no kind of like certain people if they will inject in an unsterile environment. Um, your system will encapsulate it and it'll keep it these balls of oils in your body that can break open and cause a lot of problems later on. We don't see any of those. We don't see the additional crazy scar tissue. We see actual muscle tissue. How could that possibly be happening? Over in uh, Synthetech, Synthetic, however you pronounce that, so Synthrol, over in that mm -hmm. world, they had the, I think it was the original guy, I'm not sure who he was, but he broke down their original product and talked about how certain fatty acids 
will start driving specific site location, muscle protein synthesis, and all these cool things. So that's potentially one. We go into the stretching of the actual fascia. And if anyone is doing a lot of extreme stretching, like DC style, stuff like that, you realize pretty quickly, oh, if we're constantly stretching this muscle belly, good things happen, not just the quality and texture, but overall growth. So that's kind of two. And the third one is just localized inflammation. We're not getting systemic inflammation with these products because we're checking HSCRPs, all the blood work, we're not seeing HSCRPs of like 10s or 11s, we're seeing them normal, like 0.5 or one or something like that. So it's one of those three mechanisms, who really knows which one, but we know they actually work. So actual product wise, if you go the Synthrol route with Synthetech, that is a daily use product. So you'd have to apply it to the muscle belly every single day. That is a potential maybe long term for problems with any product you use because constantly piercing that muscle tissue barrier. Uh, over time, I don't see anyone getting actual uh, tissue fibrosis unless that they really abuse it. But those are the ones that do, you know, six cc's per day and they're doing that you know, for years on end. Those people have problems. But Synthrol is a really good product if you want to use a daily application. Boston Lloyd's product Formula 3 has uh, different oily constituents in there that will release at a slower rate and it'll metabolize at a slower rate. So you can do one injection per week. Same kind of thing. It's going to be sitting there just for that week and then clear. But during that time, it's one of those three mechanisms that's causing localized growth. So you yeah, that, have, like to me, those are the, the two best SEOs on the market in terms of an oil uh, substance. And then a couple of like the metaforms and things like that are the uh, water-based ones. Mm -hmm. Hyaluronic acid, pull fluid in, one shot per week type thing. And same thing, maybe potential long-term for growth, but I see that more as being like the pump player. And that's one a lot of people use, um, like if I'm working with uh, high-tier people going to expos, a lot of fitness girls are putting their glutes before an expo. Um, you know, oh, I get it though because they have to. No, 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 no. I, I, I get it. I get. It. I just, I just, I just let out an authentic crack up every once in a while. It's like the the thing I did want to paint to my audience is like, there's a big debate that SEO is like all fake muscle, and that was my original paradigm. You know, like I was like, yeah, it'll dissipate. It won't actually lead to actual tissue. Obviously, I go down the rabbit hole more. I see Boston, you know, really defending his oil. And I'm like, okay, maybe there's something to it. You just listed out the three possible pathways. How long would someone, because I think SEO is kind of dangerous, personally, in my opinion, like shoving all that oil. Sure, it's like, it works. You can do it. As you said, one bad shot. Yikes, yikes, yikes. My two cents. Like, how long would you have to do it to where you're like, okay, off the SEO, whatever body part i've been doing is like yeah that did something that's permanent there's no seo in there anymore it all dissipated how long would you have to do it to see like significant results so in terms of the one bad shot by the way comment that actually doesn't happen um i mean if you're injecting any substance in your body and you're not disinfecting the area practicing normal sterile environmental settings then anything can cause infection so that's number one like you just got to be good at injecting yourself as, as bad as that sounds you have to make sure you're mm -hmm. practicing you're not like love boston he would reuse needles until they were like so blunt like we don't reuse needles you know and that's not well, he would, he would brag <laughs> yeah he would brag like bro i'm going on my like, he'd like name the syringe oh yeah he yeah he sent and me pictures he'd be an home. asshole he'd be an asshole and he'd just like ah oh, you don't gotta take but yeah, I was saying like Boston, like you don't have to take your shirt off and he just stab it through his shirt. Yeah, like those are things we just don't do, you know? So <laughs> if you're if you're practicing normal patterns, and by the way, that's also what made Boston so much fun to follow and watch. Cause no, I, I loved Boston. Every Everything no. about his brand, I just was a fanboy of that yeah. dude, for sure. Um, but yeah, so a lot of these ones, like if you do the Synthrol variety, they have a whole protocol all line and a lot of it is building up over like a 12 to 20 week period. So keeping it in there for that period of time and then slowly tapering off of that. And even with something like the longer products, like something like Boston's uh, Fumia 3 product, you're doing it for a good 12 to 15, maybe 12 to 20 weeks of could be three mil per body part. Like if you're doing biceps, it's one per each head on each side once per week. And then after you reach that 12 to 20 ish week mark, pull back to two mil, maybe another six to eight weeks, pull back to one mil, maybe six to eight weeks. And what you're left with is actual new muscle tissue. You'll have that clearance, the lowering of the inflammation. And a lot of people, like if you're doing biceps, poor responder would be like a half an inch, you know, an additional gain to their actual arms. Other people we've seen like up to a couple inches. Now, obviously again, that's rare, but you have a big spectrum of results there. So you would, 
employ someone who's been again I, I i always make the argument seo for rear delts because if you're in bodybuilding you know yeah. a lot rear of people delts. using the rear delts and that if you want those freaky rear delts you're not gonna you're not gonna sit there and get them like you're gonna get them with seo what body parts do you think seo slots into as well like oh. to me i see biceps everything would you do lats could you make lats look People have done lats, people have done hamstrings, people have done glutes, people have done every single body part. I've had some people who want to do forearms and calves. Calves are painful, forearms are painful, but it's a muscle. It's essentially the same everywhere. The problem is you have, and it changes based on the person, like traps, you have a high density of uh, different nerves, but it changes based on person to person. Certain people can do trap injections and not have any problems. Other people one shot and they're like, retarded for a week type thing same thing with quad yeah. outer head you could do the vmo that inner portion of your quad but that's painful for most people so so if you're gonna do hamstrings would you have to like artistically inject that yeah you need someone to do that for like, you like okay how like how many shots would that be to make the ham look a lot like, of people like just go to the needle like what would the needle setup for that be i guess yeah so a lot of them uh we could get away with like a 27 gauge half inch because a lot of those guys are already super lean again. The people who are utilizing like the hamstring SEOs, they are, people are paying for their pharmacology, paying for their food, like this is their lifestyle. They have some they go to for their injections and stuff like that, or they're laid out at their bedside, living type scenario. Um, in that kind of world, yeah, you could do those micro doses of SEOs into your hamstrings, 27 gauge, half inch, and you're going one, two, maybe three, depending on your adductor, and then on the other side type thing too. So then usually having deep tissue work done after that, you want to massage the area after because it should not be hard you should not feel lumps it should feel very very natural and you should just kind of always have that low grade pump okay a lot of people Moving don't do hamstrings, though. what'd you say a lot of people don't do hamstrings though but that's just like the extremes of yeah no, like when, when you said hamstring i was like interesting i've like never thought about like trying to create a hamstring hang with seo but if you're saying they're doing it obviously there's been some bigger name guys who did it very successfully and you see them on stage and i'm not sure if it's public knowledge uh so i won't say anything but like yeah. you really make some big hamstrings but in general it's arms it's pecs and it's quads those are usually like the easy sites most people use and i do agree with you like i know so many of them are using it and i'll go to a show you know i'll be trying to look <laughs> if i can see if that yeah yeah no i am like that <laughs> like it's right there like i can always see rear doubts but you telling me they're doing all these other body parts it's like yep i'm not catching that at all yeah. not catching because that. they're doing it right tell. i couldn't tell yeah and good tell. for them if you can't tell them they're doing yeah. it right and i think it looks awesome like everything else it, it's just doing things intelligently versus not you know let's move along into insulin growth hormone pathway so this was a topic you wanted to bring up you have that insulin is extremely, extremely safe. GH is extremely, extremely safe. I want you to go into IGF as a whole first. Yep. Kind of paint the picture for my audience of like, I talk about the different muscle building pathways, growth hormone pathway being one, but there's more than just growth hormone. As you know, the chain of growth hormone, you can break that down a bazillion different ways. One to go into Kegel's take on. I get asked to try all these different secretagogues. Obviously, you know, most secretagogues are the same, but everyone wants a specific video yep. on their secretagogue. If you could point out any differentiations before I start, oh, this one, this one, like what your favorite one is personally based on all your results and then going into the growth hormone insulin pendulum and how you paint that as safe personally. Okay, cool. So lots to unpack here. If we understand, first of all, that our body releases multiple, multiple different kilodalton forms. So all these different kinds of growth hormone products that do different things in our body. So there's a 22 kilodalton, 20 kilodalton, 17.5. Uh, Can you, wait, wait, what is kilobolt? So I have no idea. Kilodalton. It's the actual size of the actual molecule. Okay. So there's all these different kinds of growth hormones that get released in our body. There's also different kinds of growth factors. So everyone likes to talk about IGF-1, but there is vascular endothelial growth factor. There is, you name it, there's a growth factor associated with it. So when we take an exogenous growth hormone product, that's a 22 kilodalton product. You're not getting a 20, you're not getting a 17, like there's no other variety. We see initial suppression and the body has to kickstart that process again after that suppression kind of wears off. And it's not really suppression, it's more blunting. 
because there's other things like header dimers, homo dimers, all these different bits and bobs of this growth hormone soup that are still getting released endogenously anyway. So when we take that 22 kilodalton product, it's able to drive us to those super physiological actions, depending on the dosage and stuff like that, to then allow us to have the actions we're trying to get. So downstream from there, most people will take their growth hormone product and they'll check IGF or they'll do serum growth hormone. Serum growth hormone, you have to time it. It's never really that accurate. And it also depends on fasting versus fed. So we throw that marker away. IGF-1, if you're testing a growth hormone product, it's a conversion process to your liver and it's also spitting out one number. We just said there's like 100, 1,000 different kinds of growth factors. So a lot of people have poor uh, serum growth hormone levels, poor IGF, they're taking 10 IUs of growth or 6 IUs or whatever, and yet they're losing fat, they're sleeping there, they're building muscle tissue, and they're responding like they're taking that amount. That's because the product is good, it's their system that's not having that robust of a response from an IGF aspect, not the other growth factors. So they're getting everything they need. The blood work to test growth hormone is very, very poor, so instead, Take your actual vial, send it over to Janishik or one of the other third-party testers out there. Make sure purity, dimer content count, make sure that's all perfect. Good product, put it in. If you get the actual biological results you're looking for, you know it's a good product independent of what's going on with your blood work. Because blood works all reference ranges and it's acute what's happening right then and there. Go into troubleshooting growth hormone, like if an individual, typical gym bro, you know, he wants better recovery, better skin, like, just the nuances, like the growth hormone for dummies, like yeah, yeah. you just broke it down to a very specific, specific level that I'm sure all the pharma people will love. Do the opposite and be like, I'm looking to get into growth hormone. What's like the top five things that like, you know, my little lab rat, gym rat brain can handle. I got you. So start low. The only real negative side effect you have to, most important one, Familiar history of cancer. If there's a familiar history of cancer, yeah. bro, it's gonna, <laughs> yeah. bro, like, that's the biggest one that could kill you. So that's actually pretty massive. But mm -hmm. if you manage your autonomics, so literally blood pressure, heart rate, like basic health, you're not getting fluid retention from growth hormone, you're not seeing many negative side effects. And if you're an athlete who's training good at using carbohydrates, you're covered. So number one, you gotta be healthy in the first place. Not have cancer, not have a uh, uh, history of cancer with your family, that's number one. Number two, when do you actually want it? So growth hormone taken. That's what I would love to yeah. ask you on the night, the pre-workout, yeah. the morning, the fasted. Where's Kiko at in that? I got you. This is called a couple ones then. So before bed is the kind of preferred one to go because that's whenever our own body releases that natural source. So there's other things in place that also get released. So we go to bed, growth hormone pulse. 2 a.m. there's a big spike of thyroid. So endogenously we're trying to match what our body naturally does. So before bed is kind of the best overall recovery, growth, fat loss, everything. Like that's kind of best case scenario because we're not just looking at recovery of muscle tissue, but soft tissue, neurological tissue, we're dumping fat into the bloodstream, like it's cool. So growth home before bed, everything. At a certain dose though, you'll start getting negative side effects. It'll just accumulate. So you can't take that big of a bolus at one time, change on the person. So then there, what are you trying to do? What's the next goal? You're trying to lose fat? Put before your you know, first thing upon waking. We'll give you some light pace. It'll donate fat into the bloodstream. Cool. So before bed, kind of all around. Um, upon waking, kind of overall fat loss before activity. People will talk about the kinetic, kinetic peaks and the actions of growth hormone. But I mean, in reality, we have all those acute effects where you're getting that initial release of ketone bodies and all sort of fun stuff. So you could do it before fasted cardio. If you do it before your workouts, if you're trying to improve and bring up a lactin body part. Remember before we talked about VEGF, the vascular endothelial mm -hmm. growth factor? That's the thing where three sets into your workout, you feel like you got a pump. So you can take that yeah. pre-workout to get a better workout and to build a muscle tissue better. Post-workout, if you take growth hormone, it's like sheer muscle recovery. So there's the five basic ways to actually utilize growth hormone. Yeah, that's a lot of different setups. Like how would someone troubleshoot the best bang for your buck? Because growth hormone is definitely up there for an average income individual. Yep. If you were very low income, but you still want to invest in growth hormone, which way would you end up doing it? You could go with an over-the-counter secretagogue, like an MK677 at a lower dosage, because mm -hmm. as we're talking about all the different background things that growth hormone drives with the exogenous source, MK, because we talked about 22 Keldart, right? MK is going to drive the enzymatic process of growth hormone release. So you get all of the kilodaltons, so not just the 22. Mm -hmm. 
So it's not going to be as effective long term because the exogenous hormone is always going to be stronger for the vast majority of people. But 10 mg of NK before bed will drive REM sleep. It'll drive that recovery. It'll drive hunger. So if you actually need that, it can get a little lethargic, a little bit tired. But in general, as long as you're managing food and blood pressure, you're going to be pretty good. So if you're kind of, you know, on a budget, 10 milligrams of NK before bed for males, 5 milligrams for females before bed, keep that in for, you know, four, six weeks, see how you respond, maybe carry it on a little bit longer. The original studies were like a year plus. And again, studies aren't really everything, but we can see people utilizing them for a long period of time and only getting better results. When would you say, like, I always get asked, like, Ryan, I'm finally jumping on growth hormone. What's the day where I, what, what should I be looking for, like, with results? Obviously, that that's a very crappy question because, of, like, a, a, what androgens are you doing? I use, like, yep. what, would, what would you tell someone to look for, I guess, like, just generally? Fat loss, muscle gain, improved sleep, improved sense of well-being, overall improved recovery. You look at those five things and then you remember that, okay, the androgens, those are the ones that are going to drive the most responses. You're going to notice those a lot faster and immediate, regardless of the ester, but they also come with the most strain on your health. Whereas low dose growth hormone, really no strain on your health for the most, uh, vast majority of people, but it takes a while. Like if you're losing, you know, 100 micrograms of fat every day, you don't realize that right away. But then over the weeks add up, you go, I'm five pounds leaner, but five pounds heavier with muscle tissue. So I'm the but same. Yeah, you thing. visually look like 3D. Yep. Exactly. That's what I say is like once you start getting that bubbly look stack yep. on. Exactly. You'll see for most people, the, the delts will start to really round out. Arms will start to round out. Pecs will start to round out. And it's a very noticeable look for the majority of people. All right. Now you get to bash me because your AI inhibitors are not bad. That was probably me bitching on my YouTube channel because. Oh, did you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I already made a video retracting it because I was very like, oh, my God, everyone is afraid of gyno. Everyone is coming to me abusing letrozole on SARMs only cycles or SARMs with a little test. And I'm like, well, I don't want to get gyno. I'm seeing cholesterols, HDLs sent to me of like two, three. And I'm like, dude, basic biomarker health, man. What What's going on? Oh, well, I'm afraid to get gyno. So I'm just blocking it speed it up to what happened to me last year had a ton of guys get that castration syndrome from aromatized inhibitor abuse and withdrawal so there seems to be some sort of skewing of the androgen receptors by blocking that enzyme however i have retracted and said if your estrogen is in range on your biomarkers then the ai is a great useful tool in the tiktok world of gear fucks that want to be you know biohacking nerds but won't put in any studying time i told you off off camera i'm like i consider myself a half nerd yeah. but i won't say no dumb shit just to make a fucking sale like yeah oh yeah you need that much arimidex do you do you just blanket say you need that much arimidex to all these young people looking to get into this no right that's what i've seen over it what's your take on ais you said it exactly right if your estrogen's in range for you doesn't matter if you're using Mastron or Primo or Remedex or Remison or whatever to manage that estrogen. The problem is reference ranges are for babies to the elderly. They're not for athletes. They're not for drug using athletes. So I can take my estrogen from most forms because it changes based on what product you're taking. I can take it up pretty, pretty high. But from testosterone, I can't. So my range is different. Most people will be in that 40 to 60 range if you're a male. Females will be hit or miss depending on their cycle, so we can't really get into that here because that'll be too long. But we're essentially trying to find the range that you respond best into, whether that's 40 to 60, 80 to 100, 100 to 200, does not matter. We're looking at estradiol. And if we have problems, you look at the other metabolites, you know, the other forms, because we also have the downstream Dutch panels we can check to see the 6-hydroxy, uh, or the 16-hydroxy, the 4-hydroxy, all these different varieties that could be causing you more problems. Usually over in the go, go into Go into Kiko detail on the hydroxys. I don't know. Educate yeah, yeah, me on yeah. that. Yep, so we I'm have... i uh, some stuff here, Kiko. I got you, I got you. So we have estradiol, estrione, estriol, all these different forms do different things. Mainly we're looking at estradiol as being the big driver on health. Downstream from there, that we have all those different metabolites, that 16-hydroxy, 4-hydroxy, we have a 2-methoxy, all these different metabolites that will do different things. Okay, so they're looking at the phases of estrogen metabolism. So this is where like calcium deglucrate and DIM really come in to alter. And then if you look like the bro uh, broccoli products and stuff like that, you can alter those ratios to get better end fates of your estrogen. 
This tends to only happen in the female world where they run into problems with those estrogen metabolites. I don't see it happening that many times to males. Usually it's an estradiol downstream and then from there the metabolites tend to work themselves out fairly easily. Not all the time, but usually it's the women that have to go and get their Dutch panels tested and see what's really going on under the hood. And that's for the female who's stubborn body fat, gaining fluid, they're training like crazy, they're maybe stressed out to the max, but they're doing everything right, but they're not getting the progress they want. So usually we get a Dutch panel, they have the ratios all on there for you to tell you what things should be arranged, depending on which phase of metabolism, one, two, three, you would actually go ahead and take this uh, corresponding product because it's not always, everyone likes to think because the numbers, right? It throws you off. You think it, it would always go phase one to two to three. Every drug has a different phase of metabolism that can alter the um, mm -hmm. metabol met metabolic phase, there we go, of estrogen. So it could go from two to three to one, or rather two to one to three, because three is the excretion process. So you can actually have it bound up and it'll get recirculated in the system. It could go from one to two, it could skip two, just go from one to three. All these different things that make everyone so different. So right. touch panel for females, most guys, you just check estradiol unless there's a really big problem, and then you'll find that range on estradiol for males. What is your preferred, like, obviously you've coached bazillion athletes on their estrogen level. Personally, I've sat my estrogen 40. I personally really prefer around 60 to 70. That might be the bipolar. I enjoy that, like, serotonergic offset. Yep. Can you go into, like, finitely where you find most dudes like it? Because... I get a lot of questions like, well, where do, where do you sit your estrogen at? And I'm like, man, I don't like if you are bipolar, you might enjoy it being up there, but you might feel like a girl if you're not yep. and might like to sit next to like 30, 40. So where do you find you like to sit these estrogens for your athletes? The majority of males will fall between 40 to 60, but we're always looking at feedback first and then checking blood work. Cause since we said blood work is very arbitrary, if you have a good libido, overall good sex drive, you have mental clarity, your joints don't hurt, if you're getting blood work back and lipids are fairly decent, you're kind of taking those five markers and saying, okay, let's make sure you're good and then test your actual blood work and see, and whatever that range is, you're good. Most men will feel that about 40-ish to 60. Then you have outliers. I have a couple guys where it's like, they need to be at 10, or they just get crazy estrogenic side effects. And it's because- It's crazy. Yeah, right, but their estradiol is so strong and so potent, they're getting the effects of 80 or 100 or whatever arbitrary number there. You know, the majority aren't that low, but there's also some people that are 100 plus and they're thriving. Like they feel incredible. Like over in the adult industry, I have a couple guys over there right now where they're like 150, 175 and erections are better than ever. Ejaculatory recovery or fraction rates are higher than ever. Like they're performing. Oh, so that goes against like my knowledge of refraction. And so higher estrogen can help. It can help. You yeah. Can you explain that? Because, like, again, from my knowledge collected, you would want it lower you should to have the dopaminergic drive higher to redo it. So what's the painting against that? Two different spectrums here, right? We have prolactin, then we have estrogen. The prolactin is more of that recovery refractory period, so that's a dopaminergic cascade used to recover it, mm -hmm. whether it be caber, prami, P5P, like whatever. And then we have the estrogenic mm -hmm. side of things. It's more of the desire. The, the need for sex, the need for arousal. It'll spark that actual cascade of, I want sex, you'll get uh, uh, dopamine, you get oxytocin, downstream it'll go through your spinal cord, it'll go to, there's some pro-erectile centers there, eventually get into erectile tissue, cause stimulation, engorgement, and that can get improved with uh, a couple different estrogen-based cascades. So estradiol, again, not everyone's up that higher, but we want it higher and normal for them, and we tend to see better arousal rates. Wow, this was definitely a crazy first episode. I wanted to introduce Alex in the authentic origin story because this is still the beginning of his path. I know everyone's jaw dropped at the end of this first podcast, and it's only going to get better from here. I want you guys to comment the next topics because Kiko wrote out all these topics. I'm going to form next topics for it as well. But what do you guys have critique wise for this podcast? Because we touched on a wide variety of things. We went into super finite detail. You got to see Kiko's brain at the top of the game, breaking down cascades live on camera, just boom, <laughs> right out of his head. I don't see that anywhere else of me just juggling his brain like that. It's crazy. How did you guys assimilate the information? Because that's going to be the key for watch retention with this is contorting Kiko's brain to a point where 
someone just getting started in the gym, learning about biochemistry, biohacking, can enjoy this podcast. Where the people who are at aspiring to be at Kiko's level get to enjoy that enhanced, you know, super niche, advanced, nuanced info that exists in his brain based on reports. That's what we wanted to say. We're all based on reports here. I got nothing against finite science, got nothing against papers. I'm a computer programmer. It's based on creation, right? We are creating biohacking. It is never going to be like, oh, yeah, I just look at this paper and boom. That is not how this works. And I feel like he has been behind the scenes so long. I think next time we're going to go into some of his crazy stories because off camera, he's told me some pretty insane shit. And I do feel like you guys are going to like that shock value content. We definitely went into, you know, someone's taking 10 grams on the IFBB Pro stage and based on Kiko's recommendations, has no health side effects. Obviously, you say that on YouTube, people will be up in arms, but that's us being based about it. Straight up, we're being based here. That's what this podcast is about. Like, we both love extreme performance, but bring it back to baseline. Bring it back to baseline. Any closing thoughts, Kiko? I had a blast, dude. I appreciate you having me on. And so far, like, you sent so many good people to me who said, oh, Ryan recommends you. I saw the podcast with you and Ryan, and they've all been just phenomenal human beings. So you have a very cool, genuine following, which I just really appreciate. And I, I thank you for being a part of that. It's awesome, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know my following will love you. Like, it's just going to be a magnet. I know the cloud transfer is perfect. I feel so, you know, overwhelmed with happiness that, I get to throw the fire on someone in my mind off camera bipolar completely deserves it right and that is what is really cool about this podcast is that we're gonna see the cannonball go off in my opinion and it's all about you guys contorting this podcast and refining it along with us because i don't want to be hypochondriacting over it i really want to just see where the comments point us and then i'll start refining it over time so you guys are going to refine it i'm not going to sit here and juggle it so whichever way you guys want to move it you guys move it you want it more advanced the entire time i'll push them to be more advanced you're like i can't understand anything what the fuck he's saying it's all these crazy vocabulary terms cool i'll just be like what's that what's that and we'll dumb it down point is i think after 20 episodes this podcast is going to be killer and kiko's brain is going to be on full display and you're about to see something that i've been watching all the other podcasts I do think over time we can refine this to an hour 15 of like when you get to hour 15, you're like, I wish it was two hours. That's my goal. And this is the origin story. So if you have any questions, comment down below. Obviously, I have Kiko's information as coaching and everything in between. We're going to be rebranding Kiko's Instagram. And obviously, this guy doesn't need to do social media or anything. But I do want him to like start testing the waters on all sorts of content. And I am not piggybacking him. If he wants to make his own channel, his own content, I got all these guys that I can throw on him if he wants to start doing that. But this is his first test in the waters, and you guys have already seen him. But this time, it's much more broader than me just dealing with my disease. And I forever thank him for him coming to me. Didn't have to come to me. Didn't pay. Literally just threw the information out there for free and gave me a bunch of light bulbs with the situation I was dealing with. Didn't have to do that super respectful honorable guy based on family this is the guy you want to support in this industry of fucking snakes very very few times where i'm like you know my my sixth sense my bipolar like 11 from stranger things like oh this is a good person because i can tell like that when i meet someone yeah and kiko checks all those boxes i'll see you guys in my next video